Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm the geologist at uh, Mistaken Point Ecological Reserve, and I work for the province's uh, Natural Areas Program, which is the site manager. And we have four World Heritage Sites now in the province, but Mistaken Point is the only one that's actually managed by the Newfoundland and Labrador government. As most of you are well aware, Mistaken Point is located on the southeast corner of the island of Newfoundland, and it occupies a 17 kilometer long stretch of coast uh, between the nearest community of Portugal Cove South, about 125 people, and Cape Race of uh, Titanic fame. Well, this month marks the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the fossils, and uh, Shiva Balak Misra, who was a master's student at Munn at the time, and his field assistant, Paul Thompson, were the ones who uh, found these fossils for science. And uh, the World Heritage Convention was uh, signed in 1972, and by 1973, uh, Professor Michael Anderson from Munn was already suggesting that Make Mistaken Point should become a World Heritage Site. Well, after a long and arduous process, as uh, Guy Narbonne will attest as well, uh, we finally made it, but the drama continued right up to the last minute after waiting for 18 months for a, a verdict. Uh, two days uh, before, of course, the World Heritage Committee was meeting in Istanbul, there was the attempted coup. Well, the key concept of uh, World Heritage, uh, the World Heritage Convention, is outstanding universal value, which is divine, defined here. I won't read through it. And right now, before the next World Heritage Committee meeting, we've got just over a thousand uh, World Heritage sites, but only 17 of these can be regarded as primary uh, World Heritage fossil sites. And Mistaken Point is the first and, for the moment, only Precambrian World Heritage Fossil Sites. Well, it's a very prestigious uh, designation, but uh, by itself, World Heritage doesn't convey any additional protection. But what it does do is uh, put the eyes of the international community on your site, which is a very good thing from a protection viewpoint. Here's just a, a map of uh, the World Heritage Site, and it lies wholly within Mistaken Point Ecological Reserve. And the first portion of the reserve in gray here uh, was established in 1987. And then re the reserve was expanded formally in 2009 to include some very important new fossil sites uh, that had been uh, described in the literature in uh, 2002, 2003. And you can see that the World Heritage Site only occupies about 25% of the ecological reserve. The World Heritage Site is governed by the legislation that controls management of the ecological reserve, which happily for protection is a strong legislation. Here's a cartoon cross-section of uh, the World Heritage Site and the reserve itself and the World Heritage Site starts at the uh, mean low water mark. And the nominated property goes as far as the turf edge. So the outstanding universal value resides in the fossiliferous bedrock exposed along the coast. Once you get inland, unfortunately, those same formations that are so magnific magnificently exposed, uh, they weather badly and essentially have no outstanding universal value. The fossil protection zone is a, a management device that we introduced in the reserve to add some additional protection for the coastal exposures, and it extends 15 meters inland from the turf edge. For the nominated property, it also has to have a buffer zone, and it's 30 meters wide, goes inland uh, from the turf edge, and this is designed primarily to absorb future co coastal erosion pretty much in perpetuity, as you'll see. Well, this diagram uh, shows uh, the top 13 ranked uh, Ediacaran fossil sites in the world, ranked by Alex Liu and Martin Brazier, 
in a 2012 uh, global comparative analysis that they produced for uh, the government here. And as you well know, there are basically two types of Ediacaran fossil site. Uh, like mistaken point, the group of older, uh, less diverse, deeper water sites, and then the younger, more diverse, uh, shallower marine and other environments uh, suite of sites. Now, in the old days, one world heritage, one uh, uh, geological period was supposed to be represented by one uh, world heritage fossil site, which of course is impossible. So in 1996, uh, Rod Wells uh, produced a study for the IUCN and suggested that for the Precambrian, we use major events in, evolution, in the evolutionary history of life. And uh, Guy Narbonne uh, pushed this idea and finally got the powers that be, in this case Parks Canada, to agree to this approach. And so what we did, our strategy was to use the pivotal uh, event in uh, the history of life on Earth when life got big. And Mistaken Point is the key uh, site for demonstrating that. And of course, uh, one of our major claims to fame is we have the world's oldest and largest known structurally complex multicellular organisms and a host of other uh, values that contribute to the OUV of the site. And we'll just look at a, a couple of these. So Narbonne and Galing in 2003 uh, published on what was then called Charnia wardi. And these uh, amazing fronds uh, reach a, a maximum length of 1.85 meters. Uh, this is a close-up of the structure of this particular one. And uh, another feature of the reserve was the ecological tiering that uh, Clapham and Narbonne uh, recognized in their study of the uh, the deep sea uh, seafloor communities at Mistaken Point. Other key aspects of the OUV, uh, both of these published by uh, Alex Liu and his co-authors, these juvenile fronds on the famous pizza disc bed, and uh, showing evidence of probably secondary succession, and then these trace fossils on just one layer and probably a 2,000, two kilometer, sorry, a thickness of sediment within the, uh, the reserve. And you can see the surface trace. It has uh, uh, bordering levees and a, a meniscate backfill and what Alex and company interpreted as a basal disk. So offering evidence, the oldest, uh, I think, unequivocal evidence for uh, metazoan locomotion. So jumping to some management considerations uh, with regard to protecting uh, this very important geoheritage site. Well, using the classification of fossil sites developed by Richard Edmonds and his co-authors, in my opinion at least, a uh, mistaken point qualifies as a finite fossil site, and I'll go into that uh, in a little bit. Major protection requirements uh, include, uh, if you've seen the D&E surfaces, you know that we've got a sheet of glaciogenic gravels above them that are very unstable and uh, rocks are rolling down or slumping onto the surfaces and we must do something to prevent that uh, because that will impact literally and metaphorically our outstanding universal value. And again, I'll, I'll talk about this as well because right now we're, uh, our tours uh, for the public uh, terminate on the main D&E surfaces and uh, scientists uh, and, and I have expressed concern about the possible impact of foot traffic on the fossils. You'll see from a, a photo in a minute that we've got a very limited carrying capacity as well at Mistaken Point. And uh, now we've got World Heritage Site status. Everybody wants a piece of the Mistaken Point pie. And uh, there are lots of people coming up with schemes how to make money out of Mistaken Point, but we're facing a lot of pressure to increase the number of tours and the size of the tours. So we're thinking in terms of alternative tour destinations and uh, other solutions. As part and parcel of becoming a World Heritage Site, monitoring is extremely important. And uh, 
Jack Matthews will be talking about some of this as well. But you need to evaluate the integrity or state of conservation of the site and report to UNESCO on a, a six-year cycle. Well, using Edmonds et al's classification, this is Joggins Fossil Cliffs, which is a classic exposure site. And uh, on average, uh, each year, the cliffs at Joggins retreat in land uh, 20 centimeters. So virtually every day at Joggins, you're in with a very good chance of finding new fossils. This is totally not the case at Mistaken Point. Melanie Irvin from the province's uh, geological survey, and uh, she's got an RTK GPS unit here. And from 2011 onward, uh, Melanie and her colleagues have been uh, measuring or mapping the edge of the E surface and the D surface here, the turf edge, and the edge of the, the gravel slope. You'll be happy to know that Melanie's now using images acquired from drones to uh, monitor the erosion, both at the main site at Mistaken Point and at Pigeon Cove, which is home of the pizza disc bed. So Melanie's results so far, of course, we've only got a few years' worth of data, but essentially in terms of wearing away by wave action here, it's absolutely minimal. What tends to happen uh, at very large uh, time intervals is that you do get spalling of blocks uh, from the, uh, the edges of the, uh, the fossil bearing surfaces. But just simple wear uh, doesn't have much of an effect, according to Melanie, perhaps a millimeter or two a year at most. Different story. Um, with the gravels, uh, usually they retreat, according to Melanie, at about five to 10 centimeters per year, but they also advance. So in some cases, they've advanced per year by about 25 to 50 centimeters, simply, of course, because of uh, debris flows or slumping onto the fossil bearing surfaces. So in terms of a finite fossil site, obviously these beds continue in the subsurface, but from a management perspective, we have to treat these as what you see is what you get. And from photographs, during the course of a, a human lifetime, uh, basically, we're going to see some new fossils exposed, but we're also going to lose some. Oops, sorry. Well, I don't have to tell you that uh, tourism and protection are often very uneasy bedfellows, and I've got to say I absolutely cringe when I hear tourism marketers talking about Mistaken Point as a tourism product, but that is indeed uh, the reality these days. I had to show a room full of scientists this because uh, tourism marketers, well, they have their own universe they inhabit, and uh, as you can see here, hope you can read it, they aren't as old as the Big Bang, but they did hear the echo. Now, in terms of science, that's absolute nonsense, but uh, this ad campaign, this is a double page spread from the, the national newspaper in Canada, the Globe and Mail, and there were a series of videos as well. Uh, this was a very successful marketing campaign. Here's the E surface and the D surface. It's clear also that uh, Geoheritage tourism, geotourism, is a, a niche portion of the tourism market, but it's a rapidly expanding portion of that market. And here are a couple of recently published uh, brochures, uh, both featuring Mistaken Point uh, and promoting the site. Gracias. Come on. So in 2009, when the reserve was expanded, we introduced some common sense measures to uh, add to the protection of the site uh, in preparation for our application for World Heritage. And before then, uh, access to these priceless surfaces was uh, not regulated, much to my, my amazement at least. Now you can only, if you're a member of the public, you can only access uh, the fossil protection zone and hence uh, the fossils themselves uh, by our official guided tour. We also introduced the fossil protection zone and uh, people on our tour now when they arrive at 
D&E remove their footwear and they're given a pair of bomber booties, uh, bright blue booties, very fashionable, but they're, they also have a very important psychological impact. When you go to the Taj Mahal, you take your shoes off and you put on little plastic booties. And these do definitely uh, focus people who, people's minds that, yes, this is something special that I'm about to walk on. Also, we have a permit system uh, whereby if you're interested in doing scientific research, you contact natural areas and we can issue a, a scientific research or other appropriate permit. We don't allow any collecting of fossils uh, at the site. Uh, you can latex them or laser scan them, but there are a number of uh, holotypes in situ at mistaken point, which again is why we must have to be so vigilant about protecting the site. In terms of carrying capacity, our tour uh, maximum at the moment is uh, 12 persons. There are a couple of uh, students and an interpreter here. Why such a small uh, tour group is the question we're, we're asked frequently. Well, for public safety, there's a 12 meter drop to rocks in the ocean here. And if you fall in there, it's a recovery operation, not a rescue operation. Also, uh, when you're an interpreter and you're, you're looking at fossils with a, a member of the public and maybe the students aren't paying as much attention as they should, we've had luckily only once a child scratch their name on the fossil bearing surface. Uh, look, you know, people do like to pocket souvenirs. You have to be pretty vigilant. But also it's the quality of the visitor's experience. You know, how much time can the interpreter give someone one-on-one -on -one when they're, they're having for many people the experience of a lifetime by treading on the, the amazing E surface? So one of the things we've got to do is expand our, our types of tours that we offer. And we're looking for alternative tour sites. And this is the obvious candidate, which Guy and I have been trying to promote since 2008. And it's the same E surface as a kilometer uh, west at Mistaken Point. But here it's at the mouth of a little stream called Watton Cove. And it's dipping at 52 degrees. So all we need to do is uh, in place a set of steps so the public uh, on the tours can access it safely. They can stand down here as some of you here have done. They can touch the fossils, which they all say they want to do, photograph them close up, and uh, they can't walk up the surface. So it's a perfect uh, alternative site, and it cuts two kilometers off the six kilometer long uh, round trip hike. Well, obviously, we're extremely interested in what uh, erosion is doing to the, the main fossil bearing surfaces. There are many natural erosion processes that uh, are affecting them. Uh, but the only one we can do anything about is the spalling of, of material uh, coming off the gravel slopes and the rock walls. So with uh, fossil preservation quality like this, we're also very interested to know uh, what's happening uh, in terms of foot traffic on the surfaces. A number of scientists have expressed their concern about this. So uh, we decided that we better get someone to look at this in detail. And uh, this is the perfect transition to the next talk uh, with Jack Matthews, as usual, lying down on the job. And uh, he'll tell you all about his research. So thanks very much.